Good morning. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, I guess it's actually afternoon, isn't it? Um, you know, Spencer promised this year that the brown bags would be really exciting. Um, and those of you that were here last week found out that that was truly so, wasn't it? Yeah, it got a little excited. But I feel fine. I think I was a little dehydrated and uh, needed to sit a little. Um, I hate to tell anybody, any of you younger people, but when you get old, you don't want to stand too long. You need that chair, too. So it felt good to, uh, to sit down. Well, today I'd like to do a little introduction. Before I do, let me tell you that next week, the brown bag will be at the chapel. It will not be in this room. There was a scheduling problem and will be over at the chapel. So keep that in mind. It'll be a good program because you'll get to know our new director, uh, Spencer Barton, much better as he talks uh, for the program at that time. But today we've got a great program. I'm really pleased that I already have had the chance to meet Dr. Rietfeld. Uh, this is Dr. Ronald Rietfeld and he's an expert on anything Lincoln and uh, ties in nicely with our Harlan Lincoln House here. Uh, Dr. Rietfeld speaks uh, several different languages. I'm just hoping that he speaks in English today for us um, rather than one of the other languages that he speaks. He has a BA from Wheaton College, uh, a uh, BD, a divinity degree from Bethel Seminary up in St. Paul and a PhD from the University of Illinois. And his uh, background is working in various uh, positions in education, enjoying to work with young people. And uh, he's a, the professor emeritus from California State University in Fullerton, California. I think the biggest thing here that I will say about Dr. Rietfeld is the fact that at a very early age, he developed a passion. And that's a wonderful thing to have when you're a teenager. Um, and his passion, of course, was uh, anything Lincoln, as I said. Uh, he was fortunate in developing that passion as a young man because it gave him the opportunity to meet many of the Lincoln scholars over the years. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rietfeld. His wife, Ruth, is here, too, wearing our Iowa Wesleyan colors, as I did today, too. So, Dr. Rietfeld, it's all yours. I'm here. And you're here. So we got to do something together, huh? Well, I'm so happy to be here, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I should welcome you in my native Dutch language. How would that be? Ik ben erg blij alles jullie te zien. I'm very happy to see all of you. And it's nice to be here. He mentioned languages. I ended up with a six-language background. But it's not because I wanted to. Every degree I got required a different language. <laughs> They wouldn't take my English, certainly, and they didn't want my Dutch. So I ended up with French, German, Greek, Spanish, whatever. But I'm glad to have had that background. It's a joy to be with you. Let me share something of my background. Started very early. Maybe before I get too far, I want to show you something. You see that? That hung in my third grade classroom at Brooks School in Des Moines, Iowa. And I got it in 1944. And it comes from Yonkers. It says here, sponsored by Yonkers, in recognition of your loyalty to and participation in the war effort, 1942-1944. This was given out by Yonkers in appreciation for those who supported the Allied effort in World War II. 
And during that time, part of my family lived in the Netherlands under Nazi occupation. And I have, Ruth and I have had a very dear friend. You may know, know the name. Her name is Corrie ten Boom. She adopted us as family. And so we lived through the war years in her memory many times. But I thought you'd like to see what I got in 1944 that documents how long ago I became interested in Abraham Lincoln. I think it's rather a young person's interest that is amazing at my stage. I can't take credit for it. I really believe the Lord instructed me as a young boy and stayed with me all these years in my interest in Mr. Lincoln, already as a young boy. I developed a serious interest in his life and times. And during the war years, as you could tell from my picture, 1943-44, I pursued an interest by purchasing my first Lincoln books. I still have them. One of them is H. Jack Lang's work on the wit and wisdom of Abraham Lincoln, published in 1944. Then I purchased the, another book, which was Enid Lamont's Meadowcraft's book, Abraham Lincoln. That was also in January of 1944. And so, my interest began with good, solid reading. During those same war years, I began an early habit of clipping newspaper magazine articles about Lincoln. They came from such magazines as Look and Life, as well as newspapers from the Des Moines Register and Tribune and the Chicago Tribune. Most of these were published at the holiday period of Lincoln's birthday, of course. But when special Lincoln events made national news, I took note. A special example of that was the opening of the so-called secret Lincoln papers at the Library of Congress in 1947. I later became a friend of C. Percy Powell, who had cataloged the Robert Todd Lincoln collection earlier when he gave them to the Library of Congress about 1918. Percy Powell knew exactly what was, was in those papers, but they weren't open till 1947. Later, Ruth and I enjoyed our visits discussing this exciting event with Mrs. Ruth Painter Randall. You may know her as the authoress of a biography of Mary Lincoln. Mary Lincoln biography of marriage. As a result of her time there at the opening of the paper, she and Jim, Jim Randall, a well-known Lincoln scholar, stayed on as they worked in the Lincoln papers that had been opened. As a result of my growing interest in Lincoln's life, I wrote various Lincoln sites for information and I corresponded with a few superintendents of those sites. I still have one of them returned to me, and it cost me 10 cents to get the information. Well, I discovered and devoured every Lincoln book I could find in the Des Moines Public Library, and the librarian graduated me up to the adult section I had devoured everything where kids could read. And so I checked out the six volume set of Carl Sandburg's Lincoln. I read them all. I finished them and I wrote Carl Sandburg. I wrote him three different letters. Today they are housed in the Carl Sandburg Papers Collection at the University of Illinois Library and he sent me an autograph photograph of himself. At that same time, there appeared an article in the Des Moines Register 
which told of the remaining Civil War veterans still alive. By the start of the 1950s, about 65 of the blue and gray veterans were still living. By 1955, there were about a half dozen left. I had written the half dozen. The last veteran said he fought for the Union was Albert Wilson of Duluth, Minnesota. And Walter Williams said he was the last Confederate. I wrote to both of them, but only Wilson was genuinely the last living Civil War veteran. Today, there's a bronze statue on Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg, not because he fought there, but because he's the last living Civil War veteran and member of the Grand Army of the Republic. And I've just visited not too long ago that statue when the bus pulled up. I was leading a Civil War tour from California to the East Coast, and there stands Richard Serrano's last of the blue and gray. And my correspondent now is in metal. So the bus driver pulled over and said, we need to take a picture with your friend. Well, he's pretty cold now. <laughs> in fact, my very first talks about Lincoln were to the Daughters of Union Veterans in Des Moines. I called them the old girls. We had good times together, and I remember one old girl said, Ronald, after I had spoken to one of their Lincoln T's, I want to show you something. She got out a great big black handbag. I was embarrassed. As in Dutch, we use the word schoom. She schoomed in her bag to find something. And she pulled out a roll of toilet paper. Now remember, I'm 15. I turned kind of pinkish or whatever color that is. What's she doing with toilet paper? And she unrolled the whole thing and came down to a small piece of ivory about so big. She says, Ronald, do you know what this is? I said, no, ma'am, I sure don't know. She said, this is a chicken bone. I said, what? She said, my daddy carved this at Andersonville. And every day he put a new notch in it holding his sanity, and I take it with me everywhere I go. And how often I've thought when she passed away and they went into that purse, what would they have found? Toilet paper, not knowing what was there. Dr. Lewis A. Warren, who was the director of Lincoln National Life Foundation and the library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, frequently traveled the nation speaking on Lincoln. He came to speak at Des Moines Lincoln High School, and I was permitted to leave my junior high school of Amos Hyatt to visit and listen to his talk. We became corresponding friends. Dr. Warren was a great encouragement to this young boy. I later wrote Dr. Warren a letter requesting advice for me and pursuing a serious career in the Lincoln field. And he returning, returning an answer, said I needed to pursue an academic career. Later, when I completed my doctoral work in history at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, I wrote him a thank you note, informing Dr. Warren that I had taken his advice seriously and had done exactly what he suggested in the years that followed. By reading the Des Moines Register, I read about federal judge James W. Bollinger of Davenport, Iowa, who was an avid Lincoln student and over a period of 48 years <clears throat> had collected everything he could find concerning the Civil War president. He became a prominent figure among Lincoln collectors and scholars. His father was a Civil War veteran, a Union soldier. His mother, as a young girl, had seen Lincoln personally. So his intense interest in Lincoln originated 
with a gift book from his mother in 1903, Nancy Hanks, colon, a story of Abraham Lincoln's mother, which led to his 3,500 volume library, valued then at $350,000. He became one of the six most important collectors of Lincolniana in the country. Upon his death, he decreed his collection had to become a gift to the University of Iowa. And we became corresponding Lincoln friends, Iowa's oldest and youngest Lincoln enthusiasts. One day, I received a call, phone call from Clyde C. Walton, curator of rare books at the University of Iowa Library, and later became state historian. He questioned my letter of interest in attending the dedication scheduled for November 19 and 20 in 1951 in Iowa City. Are you for real? That's what he asked me on the phone. He found it difficult to believe that one so young would be so interested in Lincoln and would like to attend the dedication. I was invited to be a guest. And mother put me on the Rock Island rocket and headed to Iowa City from Des Moines by myself. I was met by a family of our Des Moines lawyer and stayed two days with them while I attended the dedication. All the guest speakers I had written to, Harry Pratt, Illinois State Historian, Benjamin Platt Thomas, authored one of the finest biographies of Lincoln. He edited then the Abraham Lincoln Quarterly in Springfield, Charles Lynch, Cedar Rapids attorney, and Lewis Warren, director of the Lincoln National Foundation. But I also enjoyed a nice visit with Fernand's Pond, whose family settled in New Salem and knew the young Lincoln personally. And so I was believed the paper said to be the, I quote, uh, the youngest full-fledged Lincoln collector in the country. That's what the Iowa City paper said. Ronald took two days from his classes at Amos Hyatt Junior High School to attend the dedication, talk to his fellow collectors. He's corresponded with several of them in the past and was thrilled at the chance to meet with them face to face. Prize item in Ronald's own collection is a letter written by Hannibal Hamlin, Lincoln's vice president. While there, Dr. Harry Pratt took a liking to a young boy. Remember I said he was state historian of Illinois. Well, he said, have you ever been to Springfield, Ronald? Have you seen Lincoln's home or tomb? I said, no, sir, I have not. He said, how would you like to come next summer? Stay a week with Marion and me, and we'll take you to all the Lincoln sites. So Dr. and Mrs. Pratt met me at the Greyhound bus station. Again, I went on the buses by myself, I even changed in Galesburg by myself, <laughs> and went with them to Springfield. I especially enjoyed meeting Virginia Stewart Brown, who was related to Mary Lincoln through her cousin John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's first law partner. And she was living on the second floor of the Lincoln home, which was not open to the public then. And she was taking care of the house. She was an artist who enjoyed sketching Lincoln-related objects and presented me with her first edition of her Through Lincoln's Door, 1952. I accompanied Dr. Pratt to the Illinois State Historical Library, then housed in the Centennial Building in Springfield on a Sunday morning, July 20, 1952. And while he worked on a book review for a historical journal and needed some time to finish it, he meanwhile dropped Marion, we had dropped her off at the Lincoln home where she was working on the collected works. And he took me to the Lincoln Horner room in the Centennial Building and then walked me to the file of the Nicolay Hay collection, standing in the vestibule of the library. He unlocked a file, instructed me to feel free to pursue the collection given by John Hay's daughter in 1940. I could select anything I wished to see and take it to the Lincoln Hoarder room, but I must return it 
to the exact location from which I had taken it. I came to the file folder, I'll never forget, marked X colon 14. It contained John Nicolay, who was Lincoln's White House secretary, contained his notes about Mrs. Lincoln's visit to City Point, Virginia, and the fiasco which occurred there after her head had been struck on the top of the carriage in company with Mrs. U.S. Grant. Perhaps you know the story. When I finished, when I had finished those notes, I found an envelope sent from Minnesota to John Nicolay in Washington, D.C. in 1887. It contained three pieces of stationery. The largest was a letter to which Louis H. Stanton, son of Secretary of War Stanton, said, I have found this in my father's papers, and perhaps you'd like to use it. I placed the letter back in the envelope, and then realized that I had not looked at the other two pieces of stationery. And in the center of the three folded piece of stationery, lay a small, what I thought was sepia print. I immediately recognized the time, the location of the photograph. The open coffin of President Lincoln was the center focus of the picture, along with two gentlemen standing at the head and one at the foot of the coffin. I knew Lincoln photography well enough to know that this photograph did not exist. But there it was. At 13, the year before, I had already purchased a copy of the May 6, 1865 issue of Harper's Weekly, which featured an engraving of that scene. I picked up the photograph and I ran down the hall to Dr. Pratt's office. I said, Harry, look at what I have just found. This is a picture of Lincoln in his coffin taken in New York City at the time of the funeral. He looked at it and he said, let's check you out and see if you're right. When we returned to the Lincoln Horner room and selected a couple of books for confirmation about the New York funeral, he said to me, you've got the right date, you've got the right place, now can you keep still? I asked, why? And he responded, well, we'll have to do research on this before we release it to the country. Yes, Harry, I won't say anything, but, remember, I'm 14, <laughs> but may I have a copy of the photo? He agreed. Spinning ahead, he kept his promise so did I. As a result of this experience, Dr. Pratt later told Life magazine that I had become, quote unquote, a real Lincoln expert. <laughs> when Secretary of War Stanton learned of that photo photograph taken of Lincoln's open coffin, by reading it in a New York pace paper on the night of April 25, 1865, he was irate. He immediately dispatched a wrathful telegraph to uh, General Edward D. Townsend, who was in charge of the mission of returning Lincoln's body back to Springfield, Illinois. Stanton's instructions included the admonition that the Adjutant General Townsend and all the officers in charge are especially enjoined to strict vigilance to see that everything appropriate is done and that the remains of the late illustrious president receive no neglect or indignity." End of quote. After nine days, think about this, what would be the condition of the president's body? Even though the undertakers remained aboard the funeral train, General Townsend alone had given permission for uh, Thomas Gurney, a proprietor of one of Manhattan's most prominent studios, to photograph the coffin some 20 feet higher than the body 
It was to be a photograph of the whole scene, not focusing on Lincoln's personal features. Admiral Charles Henry Davis, representing the Secretary of Navy Gideon Wells, in charge of the New York arrangements, stood at the head of the coffin, and General Townsend, in charge of the entire funeral arrangement, at the foot of the coffin. Townsend could have stopped the photographer. He did not. Photographer Gurney hoped to distribute prints to the press in re re to reproduce, li listen to this, reproduce Lincoln's coffin, open coffin photograph in woodcuts and make profit by selling mass-produced carte de visites to the public and large suitable pictures for framing. Even Townsend believed that the picture would be gratifying a good, great view of what thousands saw, thousands couldn't see. Stanton, greatly concerned. He wrote Townsend, the taking of photographs was expressly forbidden by Mrs. Lincoln. And I'm apprehensive that her feelings and the feelings of her family, that would be Robert and Tad, will be greatly wounded. Townsend replied, I was not aware of Mrs. Lincoln's wishes or that the picture would not have been taken with the knowledge of any officer of the escort. But Gurney, the photographer, enlisted the support of Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, pastor of the Brooklyn Church, and Henry Raymond, editor of the New York Times, to save the photographic plates. Despite their pleas, the plates were seized by General John J. Peck their combined efforts were reason enough for Stanton to reconsider, and he gave Gurney permission to make one single print from the multiple image stenographic negative, which was still in the custody of General Peck. Gurney's large picture and the print from it were destroyed. On April 29, 1865, Gurney sent the album and print to Stanton to reconsider and he presented it to Robert Lincoln, the president's oldest son, who then, aware of mother's wishes, ordered the print and the glass plate destroyed. Stanton carried out the order, although he didn't have the heart to destroy the small print, which found a place among his personal papers. 22 years had passed when Stanton's son Lewis found it sent it to John Nicolay, who also kept it from public view under lock and key. On September 14, 52, Associated Press from New York released the photograph and the results of the research to the public. That morning, my mother awakened me around 5.30 a.m. and said that Grandpa Reedfeld had called and said my name was on the front page of the Des Moines Register. Mother asked, what that was all about. <laughs> and then she asked, what did you do wrong? <laughs> I answered that it was about the Lincoln photo I had found at the Illinois State Historical Library when I stayed with Dr. and Mrs. Pratt last summer. The discovery gave me an opportunity to personally visit with one who had known President Lincoln as a boy. I received a letter from James Wheeler of Des Moines who told me that his father had been a White House gardener during Lincoln's administration, that at six, he had visited at six years of age with the president many, many times when he went to see his father at the White House. He invited me to spend an afternoon talking Lincoln, which I did. Remember, I'm 15. Mother had to drive me. He was 96, I was 15. Wheeler told me how Lincoln used to play with him. Sometimes, for he was fond of kids and quite a joke, I quote. Wheeler reported that there was a fig tree near the White House that he used to help himself to the figs. Mr. Lincoln would tease me about stealing his figs. He said, but his most poignant recollection of Lincoln his recollections were concerned with the death of the president and the search for assassin John Wilkes Booth. He remembered soldiers coming to his home. 
and coming to his home looking for Booth. It was a scary time. And then he related that the Lincoln coffin photo had brought back memories for him too, for he had seen the president in death as well. I'm quote, my father took me to the Capitol for a last look at Lincoln. He was lying in state at the rotunda and father lifted me up to see him better. Then Life Magazine picked up the story from Stephen Laurent because Marion Pratt wanted to give the photo to him for his new volume on Lincoln photographs. He wrote an article about the newly discovered photo in September 15, 1952 issue of Life Magazine, but didn't cite the one who discovered it. Dr. Lewis Warren encouraged me to drop a note to Life about the matter, and the October 6th issue contained a correction. Dr. Warren also paid for a copy of Stephen Laurent's new book, Lincoln, to be sent to me as a gift, autographed by Laurent when he wrote, For Your Magnificent Find. I later received a book in the mail from Dr. Pratt, one of James Fenimore Cooper's novels. It belonged to a set owned by the Chenery House in Springfield, Illinois. That's the hotel where the Lincolns stayed just before they left for Washington, D.C. Lincoln took another volume from the set with him to Washington. Dr. Pratt had the whole collection, but he broke it up and sent me one book in appreciation for finding the Lincoln photo. I have given all those things associated with the discovery to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield. The occasion of Lincoln's coffin photo discovery had led to another experience. Fleetwood Lindley of Springfield, Illinois, was the last surviving person to see Lincoln in his actual coffin. Lincoln's remains had been moved many, many times since arriving in Oak Ridge Cemetery, and a small number of people saw the coffin opened one last time to actually make sure it was Lincoln's body in September of 1901. Ron first, I first met George Cashman, curator of the Lincoln tomb in 1952, upon his, my visit, I should say, to the tomb. And Cashman became, and his wife Dorothy, very dear friends of Ruth and mine, and grandma and grandpa to our boys. And he served for the next 20 years as curator of the tomb. And with my wife, we stayed there frequently. We were so poor as graduate students from the university. We could hardly afford the gas from Springfield to Champaign-Urbana or vice versa, Champaign-Urbana to Springfield. But we stayed with them in the cemetery, and they locked the gates of the cemetery at night. And from our second floor bedroom, you do see it's a cemetery. From the first floor, you don't. And poor Ruthie, I, I quoted Rachel Lindsay's poem, Lincoln Walks Here at Midnight. That's not the thing to do. <laughs> but anyway, they wanted to take us one day out to Clayville Tavern outside of Springfield. So we drove out to the old tavern, and there we met Fleetwood Lindley. In the fall of 1962, the next year, he died. But his father was a member of the Lincoln Honor Guard, who was to be present for the final opening of Lincoln's coffin. He told the story of how the plumbers opened the lining. It was lead lining, very carefully, rolling it back, followed by a fetid smell which briefly emerged and then it dissipated. And one by one, including three 13-year-old Fleetwood, viewed the president's remains. I'm quoting. There was Lincoln in person, he said. And then he related how the eyebrows were gone, but the beard was in place, and the pillow underneath had decayed some, and the head had turned at an angle as it fell back on it, but his clothing was the original second inaugural suit he was buried in, and the stock tie was still in place, but he still had on white gloves, and I was horrified. 
He hated gloves. In fact, two pairs were found in his coat pocket at Ford's Theater after he was shot. Mary Lincoln put white gloves on him? I'm still horrified. <laughs> but he said his features had turned white. And any schoolboy, he told me, would know it was really Abraham Lincoln. And so with the last view, then resealed, Fleetwood helped lower the coffin into a 10-foot deep pit. Lincoln was buried 10 feet under cement. These were Robert Lincoln's orders that never again would his father's body be disturbed. Dr. Warren's advice to pursue graduate work in the field of Lincoln was the reason I applied for graduate work at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Randall's reputation as one of the foremost Lincoln scholars in the nation still gave the U of I glowing reputation in the field of 19th century American history. I was accepted and served as a graduate assistant at the Illinois Historical Survey on campus under the direction of Mrs. Theodore Calvin Pease. The following year, I became a three-year servant. That's what they call graduate students, right? <laughs> Maybe slave. <laughs> to the head of the department, Dr. Robert W. Johansson. He was working on a biography of Stephen A. Douglas at the time. And in the process of it, I helped him put two books, really three books, together. My assignment was to excerpt everything Douglas said on the floor of the Congress, both in the House and in the Senate, during the time that he served there. But sometimes, Douglas's verbosity got the best of me, and he nearly ruined my portable Smith Corona typewriter on two different occasions when the ball bearings splattered all over the library floor. I remember when he did it the second time, I said out loud in the library, Douglas, will you please shut up? <laughs> I made a comment to Dr. Johansson that I thought it was a pity that there was no work on the Lincoln-Douglas debates then easily available for study and classroom use. And the next year, 1965, he authored and published one, which he autographed to me, my faithful assistant. Uh, one of our great pleasures, one of them, I should say, of many, was to visit the wife of Dr. Randall, Ruth. She was such a sweet lady. And she wrote that biography of a marriage, Mary Lincoln, in 1953. We spent many pleasant evenings together enjoying cupper, supper at the faculty club, talking Lincoln. We were so poor, she fed us at the faculty club. She wrote in her presentation copy of her book on Lincoln's sons in 1955 to Ronald Rietveld, with whom it is a pleasure to talk about Lincoln. She's the one who warned me that the term technical Christian didn't come from Mary Lincoln in her interview with Herndon in 1866, but belonged to William Herndon. I was present when she received a phone call one evening from someone in the Chicago Lincoln Law Office, which was still there, who complained to her about something at Irving Stone's book, Love is Eternal, published in 1954. Mrs. Randall counseled that there wasn't much that could be done. She still referred to Dr. Johansson, who occupied her husband's chair in history as that very nice young man. During the first week of September, 1963, I received a phone call on a Sunday morning asking for Ronald Reitfeld. Well, I'm used to the murderer of my last name. I'm right, well, Rutwell Wheatfield, you can't believe. So the students at the university ended up just calling me Doc. There are a lot of Docs on campus, but when I heard that across the lawn, I knew it was me. But the call was someone who called himself 
Norman Rockwell, the painter. If he were really Norman Rockwell, I thought he would use the name artist as a description. But I thought at the time I better not correct him on that, but I did correct the pronunciation of my name. He continued that Mrs. Ruth Painter Randall had recommended that I, that he should call me if I would be willing to be his guide through Lincoln Country, New Salem, Springfield. It was Sunday morning and I was getting ready for church anyway, so I said, okay. He said, we'll have our limousine pull up and we'll pick you up and we'll spend a day together. I have been commissioned to do a portrait of the young Lincoln for a bank in Spokane, Washington. And so he came. And when the limousine pulled up, a man got out with a pipe in his mouth. And I said, Bingo, that's the real Norman Rockwell. And so I took a book of Lincoln photographs with me to talk about if he could make it younger than an 1846 picture of Lincoln, because he wanted to be Lincoln in the New Salem years of the 1830s. And so we went off, and we went to New Salem, and he thought all of Iowa was flat prairie. Boy, was he surprised when New Salem had hills. And so at this point, he said, hmm, I didn't know that. And so, Mrs. Rockwell took photographs. She was a professional photographer, but he wasn't any longer sketching. He said he stopped sketching when he painted a beautiful picture of a steamboat going down the Mississippi River by moonlight. And he got all kinds of reactions from people, said, Mr. Rockwell, how can you be so dumb? You put the whistle on the wrong side of the boat. So he said he wouldn't sketch anymore. He'd work off of photographs. So they spent more time photographing a little log cabin. I couldn't understand why so much time with a little log cabin. It ended up in the picture. And you can't believe, but in the background, there are rolling hills in the portrait. And it's a picture of Lincoln the rail splitter. He sent me a copy, a lithograph of the painting a year later. My thanks to Ronald E. Rietfeld for his help and expert advice in painting this picture of Lincoln. Cordially, Norman Rockwell. The Lincoln Centennial events followed. We had major events in Springfield during that time. We had a special ceremony at the Lincoln tomb on September 22, 1962. Leslie Uggams was there to sing, especially for that event. And they had secured Lincoln's inkwell from the Library of Congress for the occasion, and they passed it around to all of us sitting in the house near the tomb. I'll never forget Leslie Uggams and her mother, both blacks, holding the well that Lincoln used and signing the Emancipation Proclamation. There's another story to that. When they were returning the well to Washington, it was left accidentally in a phone booth. You cannot believe the panic. And they found it in time. Well, the following April 25 of 65, I wrote a lengthy article in Nation Born's Lincoln and published in the Champaign-Urbana News Gazette. Meanwhile, I was immersed in Stephen Douglas. And I managed to get a master's thesis out of the Lincoln-Douglas campaign. Its title was Religious Factors in the Lincoln-Douglas Campaign of 1858. My doctoral dissertation took two chapters from my MA and is entitled The Moral Issue of Slavery in American Politics, 1854 to 60, finished in August of 67. During those years, I'd hoped to return to my alma mater. And so for eight long years, I was going through all of the graduate work. 
After Wheaton's degree, I went to Bethel Theological Seminary, pushed four years into three, graduated magna cum laude. Ruth and I were headed at one point for the mission field. Uh, we thought of uh, the Dutch Netherlands Antilles, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, but the Lord instead led me into going on to the masters and the uh, seminary gave me a postgraduate scholarship to go into Christian college teaching, they said, but I needed to get my MA and my PhD and thus went to Illinois. And so, what can I say? In the years since that time, we've had a few events and I have a story to tell about that. After President Lincoln died, there was a genuine interest in having a portrait of his father to hang in the White House. And so the Congress, and I've got the date here, March 3rd, 1869, passed an act for a painting of Lincoln to be painted that would go into the White House. But instead, General Grant chose another picture by William Cogswell. Meanwhile, there was one who was painting a picture already that he hoped would be the one, and he was painting it in Paris. This man would paint a picture that became Robert Lincoln's favorite. In fact, when it was finished, Lincoln's son, Robert Lincoln, purchased the Healy portrait said, I have never seen a portrait of my father which is to be compared with it in any way. Well, in 1937, Robert died in July of 1926, but in 1937, Mary Lincoln Isham, Lincoln's granddaughter, gave this to the library. No, I'm sorry, let me back up. I think I've got it. Yes, in 1936, it was given to the White House in 37. That's it. But hold that thought for a minute. Meanwhile, the pockets of Lincoln had been emptied at the time of his death. And we know what was now in them because they were given to the Library of Congress in 37 and sealed. And the Librarian of Congress found them locked up in a closet and decided to unseal them. Mary Lincoln Isham had given them, I should say, in 1937. They were opened in 1976. And when they opened the contents, what they found was a small pocket knife, two pairs of spectacles, and a pocket watch fob. He was also carrying a leather wallet, a linen handkerchief with A. Lincoln inscribed in red letters. Notably, one of the pairs of glasses had evidence of a small repair made by the president himself. However, the president had more than just everyday items on him. He carried a small collection of newspaper clippings, which featured words of praise about himself coming from Britain. Perhaps the most interesting item that Lincoln had on him that night was a $5 Confederate bill. And immediately, people questioned, that was the only money he had on him that night? Yes. Why? Where did it come from? Well, just a few days before this, he had been in Richmond. He had paid a visit to the occupied Confederate capital by federal forces. And it was assumed, therefore, that either he picked it up or somebody gave it to him as a souvenir. Isn't it interesting? The only money he carried 
was a $5 Confederate bill. But oh, wait a minute. I said something about a watch fob. Where's the watch? There was no watch in his pockets because it had been stolen. You may not know this. I'm going to tell you something that is not generally known in the Lincoln field. I know it. That night, after the president died and his pockets had been cleaned out, I gave you what they found. But Robert wanted his father's watch and it wasn't there. And he searched for years. You know, any son would love to have something that was special to his father because in this case, Lincoln had bought that gold watch back in Springfield in the 1850s. And it's the one that he always carried. But a fob was there, but there was no watch. Caroline McIlvain of the Chicago Historical Society in Lincoln Park found it. Don't ask me where, because we don't know. She never told. But she found Lincoln's missing gold watch, contacted Robert, and gave it back to him. He was thrilled. And Robert said if there was anything he could do for her, or anyone she would send that he could be of help to, to please let him know. On March 4th, 1921, a friend of mine, who was a friend of Caroline McIlvain, told me that he remembered when he went to Harding's inauguration that she had told him if he were ever in the D.C. area to give Robert Lincoln a call and tell him he ought to show that Healy portrait above his dining room fireplace to my friend Rancifer. So he remembered that after the inaugural ceremony was over and he found the number of Robert Todd Lincoln's home in uh, Georgetown and he said he dialed it and he could make the click of the dial perfect as he told me how he spun the dial and dialed Robert's number. And a voice on the other end, very pleasant, answered that it was Mr. Lincoln's home. And he quickly said his name and said that Caroline McIlvain had told him to call Robert Lincoln and make a request. The nice voice said, just a moment, please. And another voice came on in on that phone and said, hello. Well, Rancifer said he shook a little bit with that response, said, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Lincoln, I have a request from Caroline McIlvain in Chicago. And the voice totally changed. Oh, what may I do for you? But he said, well, she said I should see a portrait of your father at your home. And uh, when may I come? Well, Robert said, how would you like to come this afternoon? And so Rancifer said, yes, I'll be there. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln, and hung up the phone. Mr. Lincoln? I just talked to a Mr. Lincoln. I can still hear him say that. Well, he went to the home, and it's in the same neighborhood where John Kennedy lived, if you've been there. And he knocked at the door, and the voice of the phone answer man came to the door. It was a black servant was the servant of the Lincoln family at the home. And said, just a moment, I will take you in to meet Mr. Lincoln. And he took him in, and Robert stood, shook his hand, and then sat down. And what they talked about was the inauguration of Harding. Because Bob Lincoln didn't go, but Harding was a friend of his. So they talk of that, and all of a sudden, Robert Lincoln 
put his fingers under his armpits like this and said, I remember another inauguration. I was present, and that of my father. And he began to talk of his memories of Lincoln's first inauguration in March of 1861. And then he said, you know, because of me, my father was elected president of the United States. And Ransford grinned a little, would he bite? He said, how is that, Mr. Lincoln? And he said, because I was flunking the entrance exams to Harvard. And father got an invitation to speak to a, a Republican young man's group in Brooklyn, New York, about the same time, and they would pay him $200. And he figured he could kill two birds with one stone. Have you ever heard that phrase? He could get the money and make a speech to the Republicans in New York, and he could see me and find out what my problem was. So it was arranged. Lincoln accepted. And if you know the story, that's the Cooper Institute, or Cooper Union speech, that Lincoln gave in February of 1860. That speech, plus the photograph that was taken at Brady Studios in New York, even Lincoln said, were important in his nomination and his election as President of the United States. Some of the earliest uh, mementos and leaflets contained that photograph that Brady had taken. And so they had a pleasant visit, but Ransifer said to me, Ronald, I couldn't believe he was talking about father, mother, over and over again, father, mother, that's Abraham and Mary. And Mr. Lincoln very graciously saw him to the door. Now, there's a connection. Every time Ruth and I have been to the White House, and we've been there quite frequently, I was academic advisor to President Reagan's speech writing staff at the White House from 1981 to 1985. I documented a quote for his inaugural address. I was trained there when he was in the hospital after he was shot. So we have been to the White House many times, and I always take the time to pause in the dining room of the White House and look at G.P.A. Healy's portrait of Lincoln that was treasured by Robert Todd Lincoln. And so I pass on to you the story of a missing watch that was found and a photograph and its connection. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>